What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah, or FB God, if you don't respect me. And as always, we got my man Mike at Mike Me Up on Twitter joining every single week. Mike, how was your weekend? I know you were in a car for most of it, so your legs got to be dead right now. <laughs> yeah, we uh, I had to go back and uh, meet up with my girlfriend's sister so we can grab her, grab our dog back. Um, so that's that's pretty sick. I'm pumped about that. Love love our dog. Um, and then yeah, man, just just like chilling. I mean, uh, I was just just chilling basically nothing much i'm excited dude i'm excited because well first of all it's like one first episode me and you've been on like for a while now we gave nick the fucking boot we're like yo get yeah. out you're you're, <laughs> you're you're totally distracting us no no we're kidding uh we nick couldn't join today uh because he's feeling a little under the weather so you know wish him wish him good health i guess he'll be back he'll be back and better than ever or bike he'll be, he'll be bike better than ever he'll be bike we're introducing uh a pretty sick tool this time man i'm i'm excited uh noah's been grinding putting together like the leagues for y'all uh i'm grinding behind the scenes being an excel monkey trying to put together adp so you know we're gonna unveil and just go into a little detail about what it's all about today yeah we're about 95 leagues deep if you want to join one hit up the discord go to the want to join league just type free 50 or 100 i'll fill that about twice a day you'll get put in a league you'll see on the left side there are a bunch of channels hopefully if i figure out how to screen record i'll show you guys how to actually access it but You'll have a different role depending on what you ask for. You scroll down, you, you join the league. Once you're in there, you get to type and like talk with other people in your league. One person will set it up. You get 12 people to join. If it's a money league, from there you start your, your payment uh, through TeamStake or LeagueSafe, whatever you choose, and then you get things rolling. But uh, So as, as Mike said earlier, we're also looking at the different ADPs that we collected from these leagues. And if you want to be able to find the different ADPs from Dynasty Leagues that we started up, you can check out the draft guide at bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKF if you are in a state that is eligible for the deal. If not, you just have to go to bigdogsdraftguide.com and purchase it that way if you're interested. But to be able to access the ADP, you just go on the website, you go to the Dynasty tab, you scroll down to BDGE Dynasty ADP Data. It's the second tab. You click it and you get one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see in your entire life. And it, no, it is not Olivia Kupo. It is the <laughs> BDGE Dynasty ADP for May 2020. Every month we're going to be updating it with new drafts. I think this one is like 30 to 40 draft sample, which is pretty huge. And then we obviously have a lot more, like two leagues are filling a day. So for today's episode, we're going to be looking at the May 2020 data. We're going to be looking at guys that we personally think are values based on where we have them, where they've been going in these drafts, guys that we think are a bit overvalued. And we're going to cap it off with just some ADP trends, things that we noticed looking at this ADP that'll hopefully help you guys. And as the months go on and as these ADPs start to ship, you guys can purchase the draft guide, see how, how these ADPs are shifting for your upcoming startups to take advantage of it, know when the runs are happening, know when they're not, and find value that way. So I've done plenty of rambling, so I think it's time to hit the intro. What's up, Big Dog Nation? Mike, back at you here. I just want to make a big announcement. Uh, you know, I'm sure some of you guys seen on Twitter already, but uh, we recently made the decision to actually branch out uh, the Bunk Bed Breakdown podcast. Uh, into a separate brand so that just means that we're going to have a separate channel and a separate podcast so make sure you follow and uh, give us a rating on both of them and i think this is going to be really exciting you know no and i have been doing this for you know a little while now and we've really enjoyed engaging everyone uh, but i think that going forward what this means is we're going to be able to put out a lot more content specific to the bunk bed breakdown audience so that's dynasty content you know a lot of those single player breakdowns that you guys saw early on in the off season for rookies we're probably going to do more stuff like that and do more short form videos as well in the channel so Look, it's going to be exciting. Uh, again, just make sure you follow the links in the description and just follow the YouTube channel and uh, leave a rating on the podcast. and It will help us greatly. And uh, as always, man, appreciate you guys. I uh, love all you guys. We have the best community at BDG here. And we're just excited to provide more and more content for you guys. Before we get into the real players, though, just want to say this is going to be the best ADP in the goddamn market. I promise you that. And I know this because I purchased every single ADP resource in the market and I've been using it forever. And I am confident in saying this is the best because it's real money, big dog ADP. People are putting their real money behind this stuff. So if you see someone, if you see a player on here, there's money behind it. If you see a player, that's being drafted in the first round, there's money behind it. 
And the best part is if you're joining the big dogs community and you're part of the discord channel and you're joining these leagues, chances are you're playing with these players that made the ADP. And I think just that connection alone is probably worth your money, you know, uh, and you're going to get that updated monthly. Every month we're going to, we have big dogs. These going up. Noah's freaking grinding. People are bitching at him in his DMS. Like love everybody's it. Absolutely complaining, love it <laughs> everybody's complaining when they post like, Hey, I want to join a league. And like 30 seconds later, they're not in the league as if, we actually do this full time. Believe it or not, we do not. Uh, I have a job. You know, Noah has a life in real life as well. We cannot be monitoring the channel all the time, but we are doing our best to get you in the channel. So, so trust me when I say this, if you just pay the Big Dogs Draft Guide for this ADP alone, I think it is worth it because it is the best on the market. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, I'm going to be behind the scenes updating it every month. And, uh, you know, if you want to see some stuff, you got questions, oh, as always, feel free to hit us up. And uh, we'll always be there. But yeah, without further ado, get on it. But just in case, if he didn't, all these, all this data is from paid leagues. We have a ton of free leagues in there as well, but we didn't collect the data from there just because. Not that we don't think that they're worthy or whatever, but um, we feel it's a lot more reliable when people are putting fifty to hundred bucks behind that. League. Oh, it's exactly, it's exactly it. We don't think they're worthy, man. <laughs> you, if it's a free league, just people don't care about it as much. Like even if the difference between like a, even a dollar league and a free league, just the mental psyche of people putting money behind something is a, something that the human race has failed to overcome after generations and generations of, uh, I guess, evolution. So trust me when I say this, man, I, I'm not just saying this because I'm part of BDGE. And I'm not just saying this because we built it, but I, I think this is the best on the market and it's better than any mock draft, any expert mock, any, none of that stuff. Like this is, this is real market data as close as it, you can get. Now, Mike, there is one thing I don't understand because these people do put money behind these leagues and they do really care about them, which is why I don't get how Gardner Minshew is the 25th quarterback <laughs> off the board going 89th overall. We touched on him last week. Obviously our voices couldn't have been heard that quickly because the points that we laid out, and I'm not going to go too in-depth, is he is one of the highest floor quarterbacks for this season and one of the highest ceiling guys going forward, right? If he does yep. play well this year, if he does live up to our expectations and he secures his job and gets signed for a longer deal, I mean, just look at how this team is structured. They have absolutely nothing. Leonard Fournette isn't going to get paid. They shipped off everybody that was worth a damn on their defensive side of the ball. If they build around a sixth-round quarterback like Gardner Minshew, they'll be set up well for the future. I don't know what their front office is like, right? They're like basically beefing with Yannick Ngakwe, airing their grievances live on Twitter. So maybe their offensive, their front office isn't something we can <laughs> trust. But if you can build around a guy like Gardner Minshew who isn't really hurting your pockets in the front office, then that's, that's a really good way to go. And looking at what he did last year, we brought it up last week. He was basically on par with Kyler Murray aside from rushing touchdowns. He was much better than Drew Locke. You know, Drew Locke did was on IR for most of the season, I believe. And then he like started mm -hmm. week 11 through week 17. And he was decent for a few games here and there. But what's to say that Gardner Minshew just isn't the next Kirk Cousins, somebody that was overlooked heading into the league. And then all of a sudden he blows up or Dak Prescott, who was also a day three pick that in his rookie year took over and just looked like a madman. Gardner Minshew down the stretch wasn't fantastic after he got replaced. Once he got replaced and then he came back at the end, he didn't look like the same Minshew we saw in the beginning of the season. With a full off season, with basically no quarterback to over to overtake him or dethrone him this season, like all they have is Joshua Dobbs, and the weapons that they added, they have DJ Chark there, they have Lavisca Chenault now. The fact that he's the quarterback twenty five, I think that's worth it alone if he's going to return value for you this season. And if he does lose his job, if everything goes wrong for him, he still has the opportunity to be one of the best backup quarterbacks in the league. Like I'm not sure exactly where James Winston's ADP is. I think he's around like thirty two or thirty three. But he is a clear cut backup this year, and he's still being drafted at and around double digit rounds. So even if you sink an eighth rounder in Gardner Minshew, he's going to return value next year, even if he loses his job, because we know the upside that he has throwing the ball and with his legs. Yeah, look, I mean, we're not we're not here telling you that Gardner Minshew is some transcendent talent. That's not what we're saying. I am, but Mike won't. Mike doesn't want I to. Grow. I won't say that, but what I will say is this. Look, Gardner Minshew scored as the QB 18 last year on a points-per-game basis. He's right now going as the QB 25. So immediately you have value there because already you know that for sure, at least for this year, it's his job, right? And I think that, you know, people are always hung up on draft capital, rightfully so. But I think that once someone comes onto the NFL field and proves something, I think that says a lot. And, you know, people can shit on Gardner Minshew all he wants. Like, I think his, his, his efficiency metrics, uh, honestly, they weren't that good. But for a rookie to step in the way he did, I think is pretty impressive. And the most important trait, I think, that Gardner Minshew displayed that gives me 
some confidence is the way he deals with pressure. Like he has legs, right? He's got wheels. So if pressure hits him, he can either run, but more importantly, he's typically looking downfield to hit like a hit, like a big strike, whether it's through DJ Chark or uh, Conley last year, he did that multiple times. And now they get LaVisca Chanel, who's a great underneath uh, short and intermediate weapon for him. Uh, we know they're going to, we know there's gonna be a lot of passing volume. I think that's key too. So just like for running backs, you want passing volume for quarterbacks as well. Uh, so he's got the rushing floor, the Konami code check. He's got upgrading weapons check. He's got probably negative game script, game script. So leading to passing volume check. So uh, all these things just come together and it's like, look, we understand all the risks, but if he didn't have any of those risks, he would be going as like a top 15 QB, right? He's going as QB 25. So just the start of the QB three edge. And what if he has a job, man? Like you're already being pricing him as if he does not have the job, as if it's a guarantee they're going to get Trevor Lawrence. There's just too many question marks. And this is just a easy risk reward trade-off to make. Yeah, and by comparison, Drew Locke is going four rounds earlier yeah. than Gardner Minshew. And the only reason for that is, sure, he, he had draft capital, right? And they add a few weapons here and there. But I wouldn't say that the Denver Broncos weapons group, this might be like ignorant, but I don't think it's like worlds better than what Jacksonville has. Like we've seen the proven talent in a DJ Chark. We know what LaVisca mm -hmm. Chenault can do. Leonard Fournette probably deteriorates that weapons group, but we haven't seen Jerry Judy in the NFL. We haven't seen KJ Hamler in the NFL. We haven't seen Albert O in the NFL. Melvin Gordon isn't the most efficient guy. They have Cortland Sutton and then Noah Fant flash sometimes last year. So the weapons group, I'll obviously give the edge to Denver, but I don't think Jacksonville is a – a bottom half of the league type of weapons yeah. maybe they're around like average but like i don't think that should be something that takes away from Gardner Minshew. the only reason he's going here is because we don't trust the job security but then again mm -hmm. we, like how many teams do we think are going to go 0 and 16 and 1 and 15 every year and they just surprise us like miami so yeah if the, the chances that they just tank the entire season and go 0 and 16 i think are very unlikely especially when you have a team like washington in the nfl who does not want to do anything right so if he does get a job next year, then he's going to be one of the best value picks you could have made this season. Yeah. And Drew Locke is not good either. Like Drew Locke under pressure. I don't know if you've ever seen Drew Locke under pressure. He wasn't good in college and he's still not good in the NFL. So like I, I get the hype about like all the weapons and stuff like that. And look, I, I love the weapons in Denver, but at the same time, like I'm just not on board with Drew Locke, especially at these types of prices. If they were going at the same price, I could maybe understand it. Right. But like when it comes to quarterbacks, like second round draft capital, like was he he drafted the second round, right? The second so, or third yeah. round, yeah. Like that's not that good either for quarterbacks. Like most second rounders are also backups. Uh, so like uh, like people that think he has job security, like I don't think the job security is really that much more safe uh, than in this regard to Minshew. Like if both of them flop, they're both gonna get fired next year. Like so, I mean, I think I think it's I think it's a lot closer than than the price reflects. Basically. Yeah, I agree with you on that front. And another guy who. It should probably be a backup, but he just seems to start wherever he goes and just blow the hell up. It's Ryan Fitzpatrick, and I can guarantee you, you have never heard somebody talk up Ryan Fitzpatrick on a dynasty show, but that's what we're going to do today. Going 173rd off the board, I can't do mental math, but that's probably like round 15 or 16. Quarterback 39, and these are super flex leagues. He's going after Tevin Coleman, Darrington Evans, but he's also going after Tyrod Taylor, who when you think about it, right, Tyrod Taylor and Ryan Fitzpatrick are almost identical in terms of their dynasty value when it comes to their shelf life. They're probably going to start at least eight games this year, but I would put a, a higher chance that Ryan Fitzpatrick plays the entire season out than Tyrod Taylor playing the entire season out. Now, if Tyrod Taylor plays the entire season and he is the Chargers quarterback, I do think he's going to be better than Ryan Fitzpatrick because he does have that rushing upside. But when you get a guy who last year was the quarterback two from week six to 17, in an offense that is surrounded by a guy like Devontae Parker, Mike Kosicki, who we hope is good, Preston Williams maybe trash. coming back from <laughs> – Trash. I know you don't like him. Uh, Preston Williams coming back from an ACL. Sure, it's not ideal, but what did they have last year? Like Albert Wilson, Kenny Stills for half the season, and Devontae Parker. It's They're in a team that is in a tougher division because Buffalo is better than them. The Patriots shouldn't be better than them, but they will be. The Jets kind of suck, so every game is going to be like 34-37 type of shootout. But they're going to probably be in a lot of negative game scripts despite like improving their defense a little bit. Their running game still wasn't a major focus. Like They brought in Jordan Howard and Matt Breida. Neither of them are like actual workhorses that are going to change your running game. And as a quarterback, 39 off the board, if you want to get a two attack of Aloha or you invest in two quarterbacks early and you want to wait until whatever this is, like round 15 to 16, and get a Ryan Fitzpatrick, somebody that you can trust in your flex in a week where one of their quarterbacks is on a bye, it's just a huge steal because a guy like Tevin Coleman, we saw last year, he had that like one four touchdown game. He was nothing for you the rest of the season. 
Darrington Evans is a pure handcuff. And, you know, other than Tyrod Taylor, like a lot of the guys in that range are never going to crack your starting lineup. And you have to wait for one or two injuries for them to be fantasy relevant. Whereas Ryan Fitzpatrick, sure, he's not going to give you any type of return a year from now. But for this season alone, he's going to be one of the most valuable players you can get because he's going to, even if you have like a Drew Locke or Ryan Tannehill, there are going to be some weeks you want to start Ryan Fitzpatrick over him because of matchup, because they're playing the Jets. So I just see him as a huge steal as the quarterback 39 off the board. Somebody that if you are in win now mode, like you should definitely trade up and try to get him if you're around, you know, round 17, he hasn't gone off the board yet. Just move up, send like a 20th or 22nd and some other bullshit and get him because you know, he's going to be able to crack your starting lineup right away. Yeah. He's a, he's a great plug and fill man. Fits magic. Just like, man, what a, what a fantasy gold mine, you know? And <laughs> he used to and run the ball be- too. Last year, kind of bumped yeah. his head a few times. So. Yeah, he he had like what fifty four rushing attempts for two hundred and forty three yards. So he's you know he's not he's not a Kyler Murray, he's not a Lamar Jackson, but he's, he's giving you some four there. And the the beauty of Ryan Fitzpatrick is like he has no fear, right? Like he's willing to chuck it. He's he's a fuck it and chuck it guy. Except it's he's crazy actually got an Harvard guy to just go out there and not give a shit about his job. Right? <laughs> yeah, like he, yeah, he's exactly. Forty on the wonder look, and he's like, all right, I'm gonna dive head first into this two hundred fifty pound <laughs> linebacker. Hopefully, my brain's still intact when I get up. Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a great pick because it's super flexible. Like, when you're picking at 173 overall, like, like here's, here's a reality check for all either. Like, well, I don't know if his value is going to go up. It doesn't matter, okay? When you're picking that late, if you're getting, like, even, like, one or two starts out of that guy, that's a win. That's a win because most of those guys just sit on your bench and die or they just don't go anywhere, like, for the entirety of their career. So, at pick 173 in a super flex, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick is really good. Like, especially in leagues where – uh, you feel like you're weak at quarterback. Maybe you waited too long, right? Maybe all you have at quarterback is like a Jimmy G and uh, and like a Tua Tagovailoa, right? Or a Jimmy G and uh, and a Justin Herbert. And you need someone to fill that gap early on to, uh, while your other young quarterbacks get into play. I think Ryan Fitzpatrick is just a great, easy, easy, free play, plug and play uh, to start off the season for you. Yeah, I'm looking at the ADP right now. Like Joshua Kelly is going 15 picks ahead of him. Yeah. We don't even know if he's going to supplant Justin Jackson. Damian Williams yeah. is going 16 picks ahead of him. He probably is going to be out of a job this year. And even if he has like a semi-usable role in fantasy football, give me the quarterback any day of the week other than like over a running back that is going to play second fiddle to CEH, albeit yep. in the Kansas City Chiefs offense. But, you know, just give me Ryan Fitzpatrick because, that, because that's just like a huge steal. He's like the last quarterback that you can take that you can realistically see bringing you fantasy value this season. Yep. yep. Not going to spend too much more time on him. So go get him. He's free. Easy plug and play. Next up, another quarterback. He is not free, but he's way too cheap in my opinion. It is Deshaun Watson. Currently going 16th overall as the QB5. So after the big two plus Dak and Kyler. And, you know, I've been thinking about this like more and more lately. And I've been adding him to a lot of teams because he's been falling. I mean, Noah and I just took him in the BBB uh, listener league as well. And it just doesn't make sense for me uh, to me that he's falling this far. Like I get it. He lost Nuke, but he still added like Brandon Cooks. Uh, like he didn't add like that alpha wide receiver, but that doesn't necessarily kill you for a quarterback because he can just spread it, right? And like the the more I think about it and the more I'm thinking about like how like Houston is going to be as a team, I think Deshaun Watson has the potential to like supplant whoever is at number one or at least really sneak into that top two in competition with like Patrick Mahomes. I think he's going to run a lot because I mean, David Johnson is, should be in the glue factory relatively shortly. (laughs) And then he's got a lot of field stretchers. If like, if Fuller and cooks, like between the two of them, you probably have one full season or close to it. Right. Um, and then you got some other weapons in the passing game. I just think that we're really sleeping on Deshaun Watson at QB5. I'm actually thinking about moving him ahead of uh, Kyler in my dynasty ranks. I do think he's going to outscore Kyler this year. Uh, I get that Kyler is younger, but I think I think Deshaun Watson and Dak, like I think they're both going to score a decent amount higher than uh, Kyler Kyler Murray this year. Yeah, they've proven to be top five quarterbacks, and I completely agree with you. Now, I don't – not that I think he should be, like, a top eight pick or anything. I just think the disparity between him and yeah. a Kyler Murray – like, Kyler Murray, I think, is the sixth player off the board in our leagues. Yep. Deshaun Watson is going 10 picks later at the QB 16. So, yep. Deshaun Watson, I'm comfortable taking him around that range from, like, 12 to 16. But if I want to take him there, there's no chance I'm going to take a shot on Kyler Murray at six. So, I think the gap has to close – which there means that there's a there's a value on Deshaun Watson. And I completely agree with you in the sense that look at what Lamar Jackson had to work with last year. Other than Mark Andrews, he didn't have any real consistent targets. Marquise Brown was good here and there. He was more boom bust. He was banged up a little bit, and he wasn't a high snap share player, yet he was a QB1 in a fantasy. 
And a lot of that came from his legs. And Deshaun Watson isn't nearly the runner that Lamar Jackson is because nobody is. But he's a very, very good runner. He picks up a lot of points on the ground. I believe it's like uh, 27.8 rushing yards per game. We brought it up last week. On top of that, like he can produce with lesser receivers because we've seen a lot of other guys in the league do it. And on top of that, it's like DeAndre Hopkins is a fantastic wide receiver. He was used as an alpha but he also wasn't used how an alpha should be used, right? He was catching like all eight yard passes because Bill O'Brien doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Maybe having a team full of field stretchers makes him go for deep shots a little bit more, even though that was in his repertoire and he was taking those deep shots. But DeAndre Hopkins wasn't somebody that was using, being used down the field a lot, which definitely caps your upside, even though Deshaun Watson does have quarterback one upside, like you said. I was actually looking into what DeAndre Hopkins did last year. He had one reception over 40 yards the entire season. So that just shows you that they're not willing to use him deep down the field. So maybe bringing in Cooks, maybe having Kenny Stills and just having field stretchers like that is going to open up this offense a little bit more. Having David Johnson for as bad as he is out of the backfield is just another weapon because they definitely didn't have that in Carlos Hyde. Yeah, he, he's a big value for me. I think the, dis, the difference between him and Kyler Murray isn't as big as many people want to say. Now, if you want to argue because his injury history, you want to be a little bit skittish taking him. There's not much you can say to not want to or to argue against that because you never know when an injury is going to flare back up. But him going in the middle of the second round in a super flex league, I'm just going to smash him every single day of the week. That did not pause, pause. I'm going to smash the <laughs> high button every single day of the week. I'm going to leave that in so you guys can say whatever you want. But uh, that did not come out right. I'm just going to stop talking about Deshaun Watson. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a magician. I, I honestly, if I were starting a franchise today in the NFL, Outside of Patrick Mahomes, I would take Deshaun Watson over Lamar Jackson. I love Lamar Jackson. Okay, like trust me, I've been standing for Lamar Jackson for a long time, but I think Deshaun Watson has proven that he's coach proof, he's situation proof. Like uh, people forget, like how freaking good this guy was as a rookie. Like he just stepped on the field and was immediately a dominant fantasy force. I remember because I picked him off waivers and I started him over like Tom Brady that week, the first week that he actually started to play. And like we have a little was, story time, real quick. One year, yeah. this guy had him in our league, and I had no quarterbacks. And I had Kareem Hunt. It must have been his rookie year, the year that he was really good. Yeah. I offered him Kareem Hunt and somebody else for, like, Jordan Howard and Deshaun Watson. I had the trade on the table. That day, I was sitting in class. My cousin texted me. He goes, yo, take that trade off the table right now. Deshaun Watson just <laughs> tore his ACL in practice. So that could have been one of the worst trades of all time. But <laughs> That would have been so bad. Before that point, I was willing to trade fucking Kareem Hunt for this dude in a <laughs> one-quarterback league. It's a 16-team league, which is, you know, obviously it's not as plentiful picking up quarterbacks off the waiver wire. But, yeah, like, yeah. that's how good he was in his rookie year. So it can't be overstated how good of a player Deshaun Watson is. Yeah, he was phenomenal. Uh, next up, we got our boy. You know who it is, prodigal son, Cam Akers. Uh, Cam Akers has been going through a little bit of a, a little bit of a weird like up and down. I think like after the draft, like a lot of people were, were like in our camp and said, look, Akers is probably better than Swift because of the landing. Now I think it's like flip back to Swift over Akers. Honestly, that that's like so close of a discussion. You can pick whatever you want. But I, I think like we think that he's it's kind of surprising to us that he's going at 36th overall as the RB 18. Uh, just just because like relative to like who else is going ahead of them, right? Like if you think about like, you know, if you're scared of like bad bad years like look at david montgomery he still finishes rb20 granted that's probably because you know he's had a healthy year versus everyone didn't have a healthy year but i would say, i would argue that the situation that cam Akers is in is a lot better than uh david montgomery was right there isn't really a established pass catcher in that backfield i would argue that Akers is probably the best receiver uh and then honestly there obviously isn't a better runner than him as well uh, and the O-line is bad, is bad, but it's not as bad as we think it is. And then when we're looking back at it, they're more of like a, you know, if, if, if the Chicago Bears are down here, like down here, they're more like up here, like just slightly below the average lines. That's kind of how I view, view the Rams. Like, I mean, I love Akers. I, I think he's still going to win out that backfield uh, over, over time in, in the season. Yeah, the thing about Cam Akers for me, and I put it down on the sheet, is David Montgomery last year was splitting time with Tariq Cohen. In the beginning of the season, he was splitting time with Mike Davis before he got cut or whatever happened to him. Mm -hmm. Yet, and, and he didn't have a good rookie year for the entire season, right? There weren't many weeks where you thought he was an RB1 or barely even an RB2, other than like a matchup dependent type of week. He's still going as the RB20 in these drafts. Cam Akers is the RB18. The floor of Cam Akers next year, even if he has a terrible season, isn't much lower than what it is right now. So it's a pretty low risk investment. Now you could say, oh, look at Daryl Henderson. He was going at the back half of first round rookie drafts last year. And now he's fallen off a cliff. He's going double digit rounds. The difference between Cam Akers and Daryl Henderson, one is like draft capital. He's picked in the second round. Two, he has an all around skill set. 
uh, Daryl Henderson was decent in college at catching passes, but Memphis, basically every running back there is good. And he had a lot of growing pains in the NFL. And he even said, like, I don't really fit the system well, which I don't know about you, Mike, but I don't like drafting players that openly admit they're not good at playing in your system. But I'll leave that up for everybody else's interpretation. But he has the all-around skill set that you that you talked about. I wouldn't be surprised if he's like a 50 to 60 snap share player. And although that doesn't sound enticing, just keep in mind, Joe Mixon last year only played eight games. There were only eight games where he played over 60% of the snaps. So that's actually a pretty good mark for him to hit. So if he does get the ample touches like 200 to 250 and he is it, like decent on uh, worst case he's decent on those touches his value isn't going to fall very far from the rb18 so if if you want to subscribe to our uh i don't know how to say it but like our idea of investing in players that are going to increase value from year one to year two there is there aren't many players that you can just say are being picked at their floor and have a ceiling higher than the 36th player off the board if cam makers does go out there and he does produce like we think he can despite being in a situation that isn't all too running back friendly, even though they want to run two more, more two tight end sets, which should help. If he does go out there and smash, I could easily see him sneaking to like the second round of dynasty starters because even right now, a guy like Jonathan Taylor is there and we haven't seen him do anything in the league either. Yeah. I mean, like Cam Akers, I think the good thing about him is there really isn't like much, much threat to him being a three down back at some point, right? Like it might not be right away because they might cycle through, you know, Henderson and they might cycle through Malcolm Brown and all that. But just from a talent perspective, I just don't think any of them really match up. And we've seen the Rams, like, really rely on Gurley on the goal line. So he's going to get those, like, high leverage touches eventually. Like, you're going to have to be patient with him. He's not going to step out the gate and just ball, just, like, ball out because not many rookies do. Uh, but I do think that if you stay patient with him, kind of like that, like, Miles sanders s path, except he doesn't have a coach that's, like, super committed to RBBC because we've seen – uh, McVeigh rely on a workhorse before and Cam Akers is definitely built for that workhorse role yeah and talking about Todd Gurley scoring touchdowns Mike he scored 14 touchdowns last year guess how guess what the longest touchdown he scored was guess how many yards it was uh like four yards 13 wow that's better than <laughs> that's pretty good for him his distances of touchdowns were four yards 13 5 8 1 13 3 1 1 7 2 7 5 1 He's just scoring at and around the end zone because although this offense wasn't great, they were still getting in the red zone because they are pretty high powered. So it's not going to take Cam Akers busting off 50, 60, 70 yard runs like Saquon Barkley for him to be a touchdown threat. He is, he's probably the best goal line back that they have right now because Malcolm Brown just isn't really that good despite them trying to use him last year when Todd Gurley was out. So yeah, Cam Akers has that workhorse profile that if he does hit his ceiling, it's going to be a huge ROI. If he doesn't, like a David Montgomery, you're not losing out much value on him because we've seen bad running backs maintain value from year one to year two just because they're young and people think that being young is better than being good. Next up, another value that we love is Le'Veon Bell, rap extraordinaire. I'm in a young like I play in the garden. They know I'm balling just like I am hard. 70th overall, the RB28. I'm not saying I'm picking him inside the top 20. I'm not even saying I'm picking him inside the top 25 running backs. He is just a value play to me because he is the last of that tier of guys that has one to two years of shelf life that you can expect, you know, maybe RB1 value, but most likely RB2 value. He is cheaper than James Conner, Chris Carson, Melvin Gordon. And you could say if all those guys have their ideal seasons, Le'Veon Bell is probably going to finish the worst of them, right? If James Conner is healthy for a full 16, he's probably going to be like a top eight guy. Chris Carson as well. Melvin Gordon probably near the top 12. Le'Veon Bell, if all things go right in the Jets situation, probably gonna be like rb 15 ish but he was rb 18 last year and half ppr point per game basis he was still a top 24 guy he signed for a long time but he can be cut after this year for not too much so i wouldn't expect too much longevity out of him but he is somebody that is basically guaranteed 300 touches albeit in a bad offense but you look at the situation that he's in and the people that are surrounding him they have lamichael p ryan and frank gore lamichael p ryan is basically a five-year younger version than Le'Veon bell but half of that skill set and then Frank Gore is like a five-year older version of Le'Veon Bell and then half his current skill set. So he's surrounded by a bunch of shit. Even though he didn't look great last year, I think the people surrounding him aren't going to be any threat to his job. Their offensive line isn't great. They did it add Mekhi Becton. So even if he struggles, it can't be much worse than last year. So you're getting a, an RB2 basically locked in off of volume alone as the RB28 off the board. If you want to pass on running back, completely fade the position and build it in later rounds like I did in the NYC League. I think Le'Veon Bell and like guys like James Conner are huge values to you because you can get them so late. You can probably target Bell in like the ninth and 10th round despite him going a little bit earlier in the BBB leagues or the, um, the, 
the Discord League. So, uh, yeah, he's just a big steal to me because you know he's going to give you the value off the rip, kind of like a Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah, I mean, look, this guy had 245 touches and 78 targets last year. So 300 touch workhorses aren't growing on trees. And granted, they're not. He's not a, in a good offense, so scoring opportunities are going to be few and far between. But I would expect this Jets offense to be a little bit better than last year simply off the fact that maybe Sam Darnold doesn't get mono again. If he gets mono again, obviously all bets are off, or if he gets COVID. Uh, but granted, if we assume those things do not happen, I would expect this offense to take a step forward this year with the addition of the O-line, with the addition of Mims and Perriman, uh, and with another year of development for Sam Darnold. So I, I agree with you. I think that if you're in a contending team, now is a pretty good time to buy guys like Bell. A better time would have been before the rookie draft, but now is still a pretty good time because people like, as you can see from these ADPs, like people just don't want to touch age aging running backs. And at some point, at some point, once you get to a value like you are with bell, when you're getting to pick 78, you basically start playing redraft because you want these guys, you want guys to start with you for like a whole season. That's like, that's pretty damn good. Uh, and so he's a great, like if you go zero RB, like Noah said, he's a great target. And I think, I think the other guy, the next guy I want to talk about is also a pretty good target. Yep. Yeah. So the next guy we're going to talk about might be surprising to you because I just like load on the hate for this guy and I hate scat backs and I hate this and that. But I think James White is a pretty damn good value right now in startups. He's going to pick 173 at RB55. So the guys going ahead of him are like Tariq Cohen, who would say just a, in my opinion, a worse version of James White that everyone seems to be super excited about. Uh, and then all the like third and fourth round rookie picks, like, you know, like the Darrington Evans and, you know, like all these, like all these guys that basically are not really going to have a role in the league. Like Darrington Evans, his, his upside, you're hoping, you're hoping that he gets a James White role. So why not just take the James White role that Patriots added, like basically no weapons. Harry is still going to be developing. It's, I think it's still going to be the Edelman and James White show uh, going in. And, you know, he's been a pretty consistent, like low RB2 floor. Uh, so in like any kind of PPR, half PPR formats, I think he's just a great flex play. And at these like basically free prices, uh, you're going to get someone that's going to start for you, like probably for the majority of the season. Yeah, people are worried about Edelman and James White because Tom Brady is gone. What's more likely, a first year quarterback relying on his outside receivers taking deep shots or making the easy completions to a James White and a Julian Edelman, two proven guys that he knows works by watching what happened last year. James White is one of the safer guys. He doesn't have the ceiling of a lot of running backs, but as running back 55, I'd argue he has a higher ceiling than all those guys because he's probably going to finish as the RB 17 this year, which he does every single season. He's like Lamar Miller in that sense, because if you look back through Lamar Miller's career, just pencil in RB 29 and that's where he's going to finish. <laughs> James White is like RB 17 to RB 19 every year. And sure, he's a bit older, but he's also a satellite back. He's not taking the same pounding that like an Ezekiel Elliott or Todd Gurley or Melvin Gordon is taking running between the tackles. He's used very sparingly on the ground. Obviously, everybody knows this. But the fact that he's going to add like 65, 70, 75 receptions to your team being picked at 173, basically where Ryan Fitzpatrick is, he's like one of the only other guys. Like I'd probably still prefer Ryan Fitzpatrick to him. But if you are thin at running back and you just need somebody to help you in a win-now mode, just target James White because you know he's going to give you what Tariq Cohen is giving you, but a safer floor because he's in a better system than what Chicago has to offer. Yep, exactly. Speaking of Chicago – Shouldn't the have disparaged big, them before we start talking about this yeah. guy. <laughs> but the next big shock to us is the best wide receiver one value in Dynasty. Since the offseason started, we've been pounding the table for this guy, but it's Allen Robinson. It blows my mind. And, you know, I said that people put their real money behind these leagues, but seeing this ranking makes me question what you guys are doing with your money because Allen Robinson should not be going at the 61, uh, 61st overall pick at the wide receiver 20. This guy finished as the wide receiver eight last year with Mitch Trubisky as his quarterback. We all know he's freaking trash. Just one of the worst quarterbacks in the NFL. Despite that, I mean, this guy, his entire career has played with garbage quarterbacks, right? He, he fooled the NFL into thinking Hackenberg was going to cut it in the NFL. He got Hackenberg drafted. Then he came to the NFL. He made people think big Blake Bortles was good. Then we all realized what the hell Blake Bortles was, and he sure as hell was not a starting quarterback. And now with Mitch Trubisky, we're seeing the same thing play over and over again. This guy is as QB proof as it gets. He's still in his prime. Uh, I think he's just under 27 years old right now. And, like, 
Kenny G, I guess you put, you put Kenny G note here, but Kenny G, who's a wide receiver 11, is only four months younger. So I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't understand uh, what the deal is here. He's an elite guy. And if you guys, I'm sure his price is going to get a bump just based off of Matt Harmon's reception perception alone because he came out on top. Like, P.S., find someone who loves you like Matt Harmon loves fucking routes, man. I, I dare you to find that person because I don't know if they exist. But if they do, that's what we want to go for. But I love Allen Robinson, man. This guy is on so many of my teams because I, I just don't draft wide receivers early. And then the fifth round comes around, and he's just right there. I'm just like, all right, well, there, there it is, automatic draft. I don't know what else Allen Robinson has to do to prove that he is a wide receiver one and should be a top 12 guy in dynasty circles. Last year, right, he had a huge week one, and Nick and I hopped on a video for the buy low and sell high. I had him as a sell high candidate because he was coming off a string of pretty bad seasons, right, coming off the ACL, going to Chicago. And I'm like, he has Mitchell Trubisky as his quarterback. I can't trust him. Then for six, the next 15 weeks, he just proved to me that he is one of the best receivers in the entire NFL, and it didn't matter who was throwing him the ball. Now, there's probably two reasons you're fading him. Number one, it's because of the quarterback situation. But you see that now they bring in Nick Foles. They obviously want to try to upgrade that part of their offense. They still can't run the ball, so they're going to try to throw a little bit more. And Allen Robinson is the alpha in that offense. So he, the quarterback play can't go down for what he saw last year. And last year, he was a top 10 guy with the quarterback play that he had. And the other argument you could make is, oh, his value from this year next year can't rise because he's getting older. Mike already brought it up. Kenny Galladay is four months younger than him, which is basically nothing. And he's playing with a quarterback that we don't know is going to play the entire season. No matter how much we hope and no matter how much resilience Matt Stafford has shown playing through injuries before, it's obviously a concern there too. Another thing too, Michael Thomas is going in the first round of Dynasty Startups. And I'm not saying that's a bad pick, but if you want to argue that Allen Robinson is on the downward spiral in his career because he's 26 or 27, keep in mind that Allen Robinson is younger than Michael Thomas. And keep in mind, he's playing with a quarterback that is like 42 years old and has one or two years left in the league. So although Allen Robinson doesn't have the best quarterback situation, although you think he is old, players going five rounds ahead of him that you see by far and away are the wide receiver one in Dynasty are older than him and have probably a similar situation after Drew Brees is out of the league, right? So I just don't see why he is the wide receiver 20 when, like when he's given the opportunity, he's a top 12 guy. And that's like on a weekly basis, right? He's extremely consistent in season which sometimes you want more boom bust guys to balance out your roster, but he's somebody that has as high of a ceiling as anybody in the league and also brings you week to week consistency. So I just don't understand why he's more of a low end wide receiver two than a back end wide receiver one. So where he's going right now, if you're lucky enough to snag him at the 61st overall pick or wide receiver 20, that's, that's just a huge steal for me because you're basically getting a, a Cooper cup like player, a Kenny Galladay like player, a round or two later just because people perceive him to be inconsistent because he's played with shit quarterbacks throughout his entire career. Yeah, this guy has played six seasons so far in the NFL. Uh, his rookie year, you know, whatever, rookie year with Blake Bortles, like what are you going to do? He was competing with Cecil yeah. Shorts, one of the best receivers yeah. we've ever seen. So. <laughs> Second year in the league, the wide receiver one overall with Blake Bortles. Third year, awful, because we then found out what Blake Bortles was. He was an absolute fraud. And then he blew out his ACL and then he got traded to, or he signed with Chicago. And that first year was coming back from ACL. And we always say this to you guys, but try and fade guys that are coming back from major injury because it takes time to get used to it. And then now that he's in the second year in that same system, despite all the trash going on around him, he finished as a top 10 wide receiver. And he's now had three years out of six with 150 plus targets in a time where the target hog wide receiver is basically getting phased out of the game. And we say this all the time, wide receiver is deep. The reason why wide receiver is deep is because there aren't that many 150 plus target guys remaining. It's Allen Robinson. It's guys like at Devonte Adams. It's guys like, you know, uh, Michael DeAndre Tom. Hopkins and Michael Thomas. Jones. Like, like there's literally, there's literally like four or five of these guys and only one of them is in his prime, in his youth, and has many years to go that you can get in the fifth to sixth round of Dynasty Startup. And it's just a crime. Yeah, it's a huge crime. And another guy that I like, he's not somebody I'm completely banging the drum for because I understand why people are apprehensive. It's Michael Gallup, the wide receiver out of Dallas, currently going 116th overall, the wide receiver 41. And I get it, right? They added CeeDee Lamb, and that definitely brings a new element to the table that they didn't have last year. But the argument I want to make is, if you want to move Michael Gallup this far down your rankings, I don't know, obviously, where everybody had him, but prior to the CeeDee Lamb uh, addition, I had him around like wide receiver 23, 24. If you want to move him all the way down to wide receiver 41, the only reasonable explanation is 
you have to have like you have to have so much faith in every other piece of this offense doing what you hope that they can do for Michael Gallup to drop this far, right? You have to hope that CD Lamb overcomes all the rookie obstacles that any rookie would have to overcome on top of that in a shortened offseason, right? Last year was kind of an anomaly in 2019 where all these young wide receivers came out of college and just dominated. But even a guy like Nikhil Harry or Paris Campbell or J.J. Arcega Whiteside or Andy Isabella, guys that we thought were good at football, took a little bit to develop. Now, we're not going to completely write them off, but surrounding pieces in those offenses were allowed to – were able to grow. Actually, those are probably like some of the worst examples because the Patriots had nothing, Philly had nothing. But you get what I'm saying. Like, it takes them a little bit for them to grow. You have to believe that Amari Cooper is going to overcome his inconsistencies and the foot injury that seems to bother him throughout his career. You have to hope that Blake Jarwin, who couldn't beat out a guy who was retired for a year, looked like a robot in the press box, comes in, sees freaking 85 targets on the season. Blake Jarwin couldn't beat him out, and now he's with a coach that doesn't want to really use a tight end, Mike McCarthy. And they also have to hope that Ezekiel Elliott is used in the passing game as much as he has been used these past two years. I know Mike McCarthy hasn't had a running back of his caliber other than Eddie Lacy, the god, so we can't really draw too many parallels there, but – you have to hope that all those things work out for Michael Gallup to fall to wide receiver 41. But when you look at the situation, right, this is a team that passed 58% of the time last year. They bring in Mike McCarthy, who over his last three years in Green Bay was never lower than 60%. And on top of that, with the pass volume that they already had, there's 11.9 targets on the table between Randall Cobb and, and Jason Witten leaving. So there's a lot of volume to still go around. So even if CeeDee Lamb is an elite player and he sees, you know, seven, eight targets a game in his rookie year and Blake Jarwin, gets what Jason Witten was getting. And Ezekiel Elliott stays consistent with what he's been seeing. There's still opportunity for Michael Gallup to see, you know, six, seven targets a game in that offense. And we saw last year how good he was on those targets. He wasn't a huge touchdown guy. Three of his touchdowns came in one, one of the games, three out of six. So that's, that's not a good distribution of touchdowns. But he was averaging more targets per game, more yards per game than Amari Cooper. And that's not to say I think he's the alpha in this offense. But I don't think you just throw aside a 23 or 24 year old wide receiver because you drafted somebody at the 17th overall pick. I just think that it makes your offense overall a better group. And he's still going to be somebody that gets his because he showed last year when given the opportunity he could produce. And he was one of the most high upside wide receivers you could get last year without scoring touchdowns because he had games where he was going for 150 yards and, you know, he got injured and he came back and I think it was against green Bay and he had a huge game as well. So I wouldn't write off Michael Gallup because they add another guy like CD lamb. I just think that makes him more of a value for where he's going. Yeah, I mean, I th it's the wide receiver is just like such a tough position to rank because like wide receiver 41 sounds like really bad. And then I look at my rankings and it's like wide receiver, like, you know, 20 to like 40. It's like just like just not much that pretty. And it just depends on what your team needs are. But if you're a contending team, right, I would definitely push the button on Michael Gallup over like some of the rookies that, that we all really love. Guys like Levis Chanel and T Higgins, because at the end of the day, like Gallup produced last year, and this is still going to be a very high scoring offense. And they have a, if you have to bet on anyone producing three relevant wide receivers, it would, it would probably be it would probably be Dallas, right? Between Cooper, Gallup, and C.D. Lamb, I think you, you, I think you could be looking at like three times top thirty six finishes, uh, so which would make Michael Gallup relevant. So uh, look, I, I I think I think the point here is that Michael Gallup, long term, there's risk, right? Because they drafted C.D. Lamb, and I think C.D. Lamb's just a way more a way better and superior talent. So long term, there might be some question marks, but at the price that you're getting him, like, you know, at wide receiver 41, again, by that point, you're really like mostly playing redraft, right? You're trying to get, you're trying to get guys in your rosters that produce and produce for you this season. And I think Gallup is definitely someone that I'd be comfortable uh, getting at that price and adding on as my like a wide receiver three, four of my team. Yeah. And even aside from rookie wide receivers, a guy that's going ahead of him, that's in a pretty similar situation is somebody like Jarvis Landry, who is older is now in a receiving group that is more stacked than it was last year, bringing in a guy like Austin Hooper, who's obviously going to get his, and Kareem Hunt there for the entire season. And I love Jarvis Landry. But for dynasty purposes, even if you're playing like that redraft type of, type of idea in these later rounds, I wouldn't be so sure that I rank Jarvis Landry ahead of Michael Gallup for this season because of those additional targets and bringing in Stefanski not being as pass heavy. I just think Michael Gallup's situation is a lot better than most people think. And if you are betting on somebody to return value at their ADP, I don't see many receivers having a safer floor in regards to where they're being picked than Michael Gallup. Because I just, as you said, I don't see him finishing outside the top 36 this year, especially if C.D. Lamb doesn't have the season we think that all rookies have now after seeing what guys did in 2019. Yep, exactly. And I think 
The next person we're going to talk about is going to highlight a trend that I've, I've seen when I was putting together this ADP data, but it's George Kittle. And it's, it's crazy to think that George Kittle is, you know, undervalued or surprising, but he's currently going at 21st overall. So at the back end of the second round as still the tight end one. So it's not a positional ranking here. It's just that I don't think people are really understanding the value of the elite guys in tight end premium. Like it, what tight end premium does is it really elevates those like top three to maybe five guys if they're healthy. Uh, but George Kittle is in his prime. He is the best tight end in the NFL. I like, I'm not taking any arguments against that. Like Kelsey's whatever, but George Kittle is the most complete and he is the one in that offense. It is a low passing offense. I, I totally agree with that, but he is the one and he is going to be the target hog. Like none of these rookie guys, uh, no, not Debo Samuel, not like Brandon Ayuk. Like no one is going to displace Kittle from that top spot. And he's still very young. So in terms of a tight end premium, like you think about it this way, right? Like you're trying to gain edges at every position in terms of scoring relative to your opponents, right? And like having a top elite tight end and tight end premium is one of the biggest advantages you can get because imagine starting a wide, a top three, like scoring wide receiver in your tight end slot when the majority of your league is going to be like, starting like pretty trashy guys and like even like some of the middle pack guys are going to be started guys like Noah Fant or like TJ Hawkinson who I both who I love I love both of them right but that scoring differential between the top scoring tight end and those middle tier ones is massive is is so huge and the tight end lifespan is actually much longer than people think as well like I think Kelsey's going to play for another few years but imagine getting Kelsey like seven years ago that's exactly where you're getting with George Kittle uh, so I think where he should be going is at the back end of the first round, uh, maybe latest at the top of the second round. And that, that's what I think where Kittle should be going, and he's just he's going way too late. Yeah, and with these settings, the extra half point on top of the half point PPR that everybody gets, looking at what he did last year in 14 games, he missed two games, just using overall score, not even points per game, he would have been the wide receiver five. And obviously you can say, oh, well, like Devontae Adams is a dynasty wide receiver five, and he's sneaking into the third round now. The difference is, and like you look at a super flex league, why quarterbacks go so early is the scarcity of the position. Tight end is an even more scarce position because you have, you know, Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, George Kittle, and maybe you want to throw Zach Ertz in there in terms of like elite dynasty tight ends. But the guys that are young and are going to produce for the foreseeable future that we have confidence in are Mark Andrews and George Kittle. And the fact that there's so little of them and you can wait until the mid-second round to get a guy like Kittle who's going to give you such a big positional advantage year after year and week after week. That's why I put him on the list because although he's the tight end one, you know, taking him ahead of a Tyree Kill isn't crazy to me because there's so many receivers that are going to finish within one to two points per game of Tyree Kill. The amount of tight ends that are going to finish within one or two points per game of George Kittle that have the same longevity as him is slim to none. So that's, that's why he's a huge value to me. And up next is an older guy who I think this year, if we want to still subscribe to that theory of playing redraft in the later rounds, is Jared Cook out of New Orleans. They do add the Dayton star, Adam Troutman, who we both love. But going 196th off the board, the latest that we've seen any of these guys that we've brought up so far, the tight end 25. If you're playing redraft, I don't see how Jared Cook is outside your top 12 or top 10 because we know New Orleans is an offense that likes to use the tight end position. The only type of target competition they bring is bring in is Emmanuel Sanders, who was used decently in the red zone last year in Denver, not so much in San Francisco, but that's not going to take away from Jared Cook's receiving upside, touchdown upside. He's one of those guys that if you take him, especially in a dynasty league, you're not going to be scrambling week to week to fill the position to find somebody that is going to give you that upside. And he's not really matchup dependent because you can just throw him out there week after week and feel comfortable with it. The fact that he's going after somebody like Cole Komet, who we know the tight end position takes a few years to develop. And even a Jay Sternberger, who's probably one or two years out from being relevant, especially playing with Aaron Rodgers, who doesn't want to use tight ends. The, the ROI on a guy like Jared Cook from year one to year two, when you draft him, isn't going to be huge. But I'd argue somebody like Cole Komet and Jay Sternberger are going to fall off even further from this year to next year. And they're also going to, how do I say this? Like Jared Cook is going to give you so much more value this year. That's going to outweigh the return that you could get on a Cole Komet and a Jay Sternberger next year. Yeah. Yeah, Jared Cook is someone that I've been grabbing a lot, especially if you miss out on those uh, elite tier of tight ends and you want to go like youth, like high upside, someone like Noah Fant or someone like uh, TJ Hawkinson. I love to pair them with Jared Cook because Jared Cook is someone that can produce for you this year. He's old as fuck, so he's not going to give you any more return for value perspective. But like he was the tight end seven overall and the tight end eight on a points per game basis, giving you about 
10 and a half points per game uh, in half PPR format. So look, that, that might sound like a little, like not that much, but there's like, there's a couple of tiers, right? You have the Travis Kelsey and George Kittle. They're scoring you about 13 points per game. And then there's a, you know, a couple guys at like 11 to 12 points per game, the Mark Andrews and the Zach Gertz. And then you have the Jared Cooks, which is like the 10 points per game. After that, it's like eight, seven, six points per game. So there is a big drop off there. And he is someone that you can basically acquire for free. And in a Drew Brees led offense, even if, the, even if I just get value for this year, uh, I'm totally okay with copping the buy button on Jared Cooks. Yep. And that wraps it up for the values that we see. I realize that we're going very long on these. So I think we'll run through these next ones quick because most of them we've already kind of touched on in the analysis of the others. So first up, we have Drew Locke currently going 55th overall as the quarterback 14. I just, I don't get it. I get that people want to like him because of the weapons that they have surrounding him. And you want to make the argument that, oh, if you want to have Cortland Sutton as a top 15 guy and Melvin Gordon as a top 15 guy and Philip Lindsay as a top 30 running back and yada, yada, yada. Sure, that's cool. But we also remember those years with Eli Manning, where he had Odell Beckham Jr., Evan Ingram, and Saquon Barkley. He wasn't good. This past year with yeah. Philip Rivers, he had Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Hunter Henry, Melvin Gordon, Austin Eckler. He sucked ass, and I know that from firsthand experience. See, I, I say too many pause moments on here. Like, I can't be saying Philip Rivers sucked my ass. But we'll, we'll move <laughs> on from that. But there's so many quarterbacks that are in situations that we think are good because of the weapons surrounding them. But just because you have a good situation in real life doesn't mean you're automatically going to be a really good fantasy quarterback, especially when we know that or what we've seen out of them so far is just inconsistency, right? Out of the gate last year, he started really hot. He had five touchdowns over his first two games. Over the last three, he had two touchdowns. And that was against Detroit, Kansas City, and Oakland. Three not-so-good defenses. And obviously, there's rookie struggles there. But thinking that a new crop of young players coming into the team, other than Cortland Sutton, Like, they don't have many guys that have been in the league for more than two years that are going to be catching passes from him. They're probably still going to be growing pains. And the chances that he outproduces and gains value over a guy like a Stafford or a Tannehill or an Aaron Rodgers, like, I know you're higher or you're lower on Aaron Rodgers than most, and I am as well. But, you know, Aaron Rodgers is a known commodity. We know we're going to get, you know, 25 to 30 touchdowns out of him this year. Drew Locke could realistically throw 18, and I wouldn't be surprised about it. So I think he's being priced around his ceiling, especially for the fact that, like, He's going before Daniel Jones in these startups, which makes no sense to me because both of them were rookies last year. Daniel Jones wasn't good in real life. Neither was Locke, but Daniel Jones was good for fantasy. And Drew Locke didn't show much of anything. So I don't really understand why he's going this high. I'm not sure if you feel the same, but it just seems like an astronomical uh, price to pay for a guy we don't know much about. There's just no way in Hades anyone should be drafting Drew Locke ahead of like Stafford, Tannehill, Daniel Jones. Like even I don't like Rodgers, but even Aaron Rodgers. Like I have him way down at QB 24 in my rankings. I think that's where he belongs. Uh, that's like kind of a median outcome for him. He could he could honestly do worse. And he could honestly do better. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think he's one of the most overvalued QBs right now, and I, I'd be moving off him if I could. Yeah, and, and a guy up. that I don't understand the value of at all is DeAndre Hopkins, the wide receiver two off the board. He's going 18th overall, which is understandable for a wide receiver two, but the fact that he's going ahead of Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams, yeah. Both guys being younger, both guys having roles that we know in offenses that they've been in for more than one offseason, which DeAndre Hopkins is now currently subjected to, and guys who have as much of a ceiling and as much of a floor as DeAndre Hopkins just doesn't make sense to me. And I was looking at last year, the fantasy finishes. Hopkins averaged 1.1 more fantasy points per game than Allen Robinson. And Allen Robinson is younger. Allen Robinson has a similar floor, like I just brought up. He has a very similar ceiling in a situation that, sure, the quarterback play is terrible, but at least there's continuity in that system. I don't doubt that DeAndre Hopkins isn't good in Arizona because a lot of their plays are just short dump offs and, you know, quick hitters that he's obviously going to get open on because he's an elite receiver. But wide receiver two off the board and the disparity between a guy like him and Allen Robinson just doesn't make sense to me. Like, why not just wait three, four rounds and get a very, very similar player that is going to give you a fraction of a point less per week, if that's even going to happen. Yeah, DeAndre Hopkins cannot and should not go ahead of Tyreek Hill. Cannot and should not go ahead of Devonta Adams, in my opinion, either. But just like, he just can't go ahead of Tyreek Hill. That's where I draw the line. I recently moved Tyreek Hill to my wide receiver one overall in Dynasty. I know that's not a popular opinion, but I just think the situation warrants it. And and look, I get it. If you don't like Tyreek Hill because of the risk, like, sure, whatever. I, I just don't I just don't really, I don't know. I, I just feel like the upside and the other stuff that he offers is just way too much to offset that. And, you know, DeAndre Hopkins is shifting to a new team. So you got to keep that in mind. Wide receivers that change teams very rarely outproduce, like, their prior years. It's going to take them some time to, to kind of get used to things there. Yep. And a wide receiver sticking around on his own team, we kind of touched on him in the George Kittle part, is Debo Samuel from San Francisco, the wide receiver 22 off the board. I don't think that's like an absurd price going at 66 overall, but the fact that you can get 
Robert Woods and Tyler Boyd 20 picks later perennial thousand yard receivers Tyler Boyd being younger Robert Woods or no Tyler Boyd is a year older Robert Woods is a few year old few years older uh, I just I, I get the hype for Debo Samuel because he's an exciting player but for fantasy purposes like I, I'm just not too bought in it's a low volume passing offense they bring in a few rookies in in the way of Jawan Jennings my boy seventh round pick probably gonna be cut but Brandon Ayuk mm-hmm. Jalen Hurd coming back from injury uh, let's see if Jarek McKinnon can catch a pass or even play a snap on that offense. But it's a low, it's a low volume position that he's playing. And people want to say, oh, well, he makes up for that with his rushing upside. The guy had 14, 14 rushing attempts last year, which isn't great. It's less than one per game. And sure, he wasn't playing uh, a lot of snaps early on. But, you know, one rush attempt, one to two rushing attempts per game for a guy like Debo Samuel. It's cute, but it's not going to really push the needle for me to view him as, you know, higher than a guy like Woods and Boyd, who we know are just consistent pieces. He did score three rushing touchdowns, but they were from like 19, 20, and 30 yards out. So I don't know how repeatable that is. Like he's an explosive player, but to expect long touchdowns like that out of a wide receiver on the ground, uh, I just, I don't buy into that year after year. And on top of that, a guy like Terry McLaurin is going after him. And I know Nick and I, or Mike and I like to kind of disparage him when Nick's on the show, but there's no doubt that Terry McLaurin is good at football. He is the obvious alpha in Washington, whereas Debo Samuel will never be that as long as George Kittle is there. So I would just take the the safety with the targets and Terry McLaurin, albeit in a worse offense. But you know when I'm when I'm picking between these two types of guys, I'd much rather see take somebody that's going to see 120 plus targets over somebody who's going to see like 80 to 90. Be efficient on those, but probably not going to give you the week to week consistency that Terry McLaurin or Boyd or Woods is going to give you, especially at their price being priced a little bit later than him. Yeah, that 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 wide receiver 20, like we said, wide receiver like 15, or even wide receiver like. Yeah, probably wide receiver 15, like wide receiver 30, just a huge bucket of people. And I'm just going to take the cheaper guys like all the time. I just think Debo's probably going a little bit too early for my liking as well for all those reasons you said. Uh, next up, my boy, Evan Ingram. Uh, he's going as a tight end five, 77th overall, which which isn't bad. But the problem is like when you think about replacement costs and opportunity costs, you talk about it all the time, you can get Waller around later. I love freaking Darren Waller. I think he's a stud. Uh, as much as people want to like talk about the crowded, the crowded like talent room theory, which is just totally bullshit. Um, but also you can get Tyler Higby like 30, 30, uh, about 30 picks later. So for him, it's not so much that we don't like Evan Ingram. It's just that we like the prices for the other guys a lot more. Yeah. He has legitimate tight end one upside if he can stay healthy, but that's a big concern. And also with like Saquon Barkley there, I'm not sure he's ever going to be like a huge target hog. Like he's going to get his, he's going to get his like a hundred plus targets, but he's never going to be like by far and away the alpha in his offense. And as you said, like Darren Waller going later is probably going to see as many, if not more targets. Tyler Higby is going to be around that mark too. And the fact he can get them at cheaper prices just makes me want to avoid the risk that Evan Ingram presents with his health and just bet on a guy who, you know, Waller has his own issues, I guess, but like he has a pretty safe floor in that Oakland offense. Tyler Higby, for what the Rams showed last year, looks to have a very, very safe floor as well. Yeah. And this next one, probably not a popular one, but, you know, I put Kyler Murray on here because he's going as the sixth overall pick in startup. So as the QB three. So, I mean, just a couple picks between him and like a Saquon Barkley, you know, a, a, a Lamar Jackson, for example. And look, I love Kyler Murray, but we kind of said it before, right? There's no way in hell I'm spending a sixth overall pick on Kyler Murray when I can get Deshaun Watson at the 16th overall, when I get Dak Prescott at 12th overall both of whom I think have a very good shot about producing uh, Kyler Murray this year. Yeah. When you think about it, like Kyler Murray is being picked at his absolute ceiling. And obviously the top four that you just brought up, like Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, they're being picked at their ceiling too, but we've seen their ceiling. We haven't seen Kyler Murray's ceiling. What if, what if his ceiling is like QB five year after year, right? Quarterback three isn't a bad investment to make, but if there's any, if he doesn't improve as much as we think he's going to improve from year one to year two, after adding a DeAndre Hopkins, his price is going to plummet. Now, I obviously have high hopes for him because he does have rushing upside and he's in an offense that seems to be growing. Hopefully one that isn't going to be kicking field goals every single time they're down by the red zone. But, you know, sixth pick overall in a quarterback, like you just wait like fucking 12 rounds and pick Gardner Minshew. Wait like a round and a half and get a Russell Wilson. Just get somebody that you know probably has a similar ceiling year one and a much better floor than Kyler Murray. I do love Kyler Murray. You can argue all day that he's the quarterback three in Dynasty. I believe I have him there at quarterback four. But sixth overall is what really – he's the reason why – that's the reason why he's on this list. So I completely agree with you, Mike. If you're spending an early first-round pick on Kylie Murray, I just think you're doing it wrong. And you, you're putting too much weight into the quarterback position in super flex leagues, which is almost impossible to say. But uh, if you're just thinking that type of draft capital on him, I think that's when you're crossing the line. Yeah. And last but not least, could not end an episode like this without our boy – not our boy, the guy we showed on the most – 
Derrick Henry. I was really surprised to see him going at 22nd overall. So at the back end of the second round and, you know, the max is going to hate this animal. Uh, you know, he, he actually said that like, look, I expected Derrick Henry to go in the second round. I was surprised that that, that was the expectation, but he was right. Like, look, Derrick Henry is going in the second round. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, he's basically going to be 27, which means he's 30. <laughs> he he already retired, that. actually. He just put yeah, in we, <laughs> we love to do that math for Derrick Henry. And look, he'll be producer this year. Like in redraft, go all out on Derrick Henry, right? But I also think it's going to be really hard for him to repeat what he did last year. Just the amount of touches that he got. Most guys regress after that. Um, and I know I say that you know, don't apply that to everyone because I don't really apply it to CMC, but Derrick Henry is not CMC, right? Like everything went right for that offense and he only finished as the RB5. So there really isn't much more room to grow. He's going as RB12, but there's here are the guys that I think that are going behind him who I would rather have, right? You have J.K. Dobbins, uh, even DeAndre Swift. You have DJ Moore. Uh, and if you're really going for that like redraft mindset, I would, I think I would rather have Kenyon Drake than... Derrick Henry in a PPR happy. We're going to be mad at you, Mike. People are going to be mad at you. I know it's close, but I think they really present like very similar upside, uh, except Drake is way more involved in the running game. So if I had to pick between the two, because you're obviously going for win now, like I think neither of them have like great long term job security. I think Henry probably has better because he's proven to be more effective over a longer period of time. But honestly, I would rather get the younger guys and J.K. Dobbins and DeAndre Swift over Derrick Henry. Yeah, there's not much I can say about Derrick Henry that everybody doesn't know what I think about him already. But the thing is, if they were going to pay Derrick Henry, wouldn't you think it's when he's 26 coming off of that four game stretch at the end of 2018 and then an entire season of dominance on top of a postseason of dominance instead of paying him when he's 27? Like We don't know, obviously, what type of year he's going to have this year. Hopefully it's the same for his own pockets. But even if he matches this year, like why would they want to pay him? more at the age of 27 than what they're willing to pay him at 26 right just the market doesn't show that I I just don't see the team you know spilling out their pocketbook for a guy who's going to be 27 when you know they can have a Darrington Evans and whoever else they decide to bring in as a one-two punch it is a run heavy team and they seem to build their offense kind of around Derrick Henry but like not that I think he's replaceable but if if you expect them to shell out like 13 14 15 million for a guy in his age 27 season I just don't see it being being too realistic. So like a guy like J.K. Dobbins, who isn't going to probably have the best rookie season as long as Mark Ingram is there, but is going to be tethered to a Lamar Jackson led offense for the future. I'd much rather have Dobbins because the chances of him sneaking into like the second round where Derrick Henry is going right now, I think is a lot higher than Derrick Henry being a second round pick again next year. Yeah. I mean, Russell Wilson and Devonta Adams are going behind Derrick Henry right now. So that just makes no sense to me. So I would I would definitely fade at that price. But if you can get him in like the third, like late third, fourth round, then I'm I'm definitely on board for a win now. Um, so I think that wraps up all the big surprises that we found when we were looking at the ADP. You know, holler at us if you think there's something else that's other surprising that we didn't cover. I think before we head out, we'll just quickly go over the ADP trends um, as well. So you know, robust RB is like all the crazy. You know, I kind of expected a lot of RBs to go because if I you know, if you if you read the guide that I wrote, I mean, I basically told you to not draft running, uh, not draft wide receivers early. But I think now we're getting to a point where, like, look, you got to be water, man. Like Bruce Lee says, you got to be water. When you're getting guys like Devontae Adams, when you're getting guys like, you know, Devontae Adams and like Chris Godwin in the Did league we get Godwin round. in the third round in the listener league. Yeah, we got Godwin in the third round in the listener league. Devontae Hope Adams, Devontae Adams went one pick ahead of us. Uh, when you're getting value for a wide receiver that deep, you're going to have to take it. And look, you, you, you're going to have to take it and then try and pair up with some of the veteran running backs later. If you still want to win now guys like James Conner, Chris Carson, um, you know, who was the guy that we just said, uh, Melvin Gordon, yeah, Le'Veon Melvin Bell. Gordon, Le'Veon Bell. So that's definitely a more a viable route as well. Or if you just want to punt your one and not draft those running backs, but make sure you do that only if you're able to gather like four to five, like next year, first round picks, you can land running backs next year. But it's really interesting to see like 14 running backs in the top 24, only one wide receiver in like the top 15. These are like uncharted times. Because if you think back like a year, even two years ago, like half the first round was, was like wide receivers. 1.101 overall was like DeAndre Hopkins and, and Odell because everyone's really focused on longevity. But it seems like that mindset has totally shifted, especially here at BPG. Yeah, that's crazy to me that like last year, I remember doing startups and Juju Smith-Schuster, I picked him at like the 109, which at the time seemed like a great pick, right? Because you want that long window, you want that production, you want a young guy that's going to produce. 
And now it completely flipped where inside the top 17, the only receiver being picked right now is Michael Thomas, who is a little bit of an older receiver tethered to an older quarterback. And you're drafting guys like Austin Eckler inside the top 24, where, you know, if best case scenario, he's a top 12, not best case scenario, but like for dynasty purposes, like a top 12 guy, you're picking him inside the top 24. It's just, I don't know. It's kind of crazy to me how things have flipped in a matter of a year. And those yeah. younger guys like Chris Godwin, who's what, like 23 years old, coming off of a 1,300-yard season, you can get in the third round in most leagues, yeah. even in full PPR leagues. It's crazy to me. So that's that's an ADP trend we noticed. On top of that, looking at where like big runs happen, obviously early on, we just touched on running back go quick. From picks 44 to 70, so rounds four through six, only three players in that range weren't a quarterback or a wide receiver. So that's when you that's see those – crazy. Yeah, like when you see those wide receivers 15 to 30 that Mike and I were talking about, this is where they're going. When you look at quarterbacks like 12 to 20, this is where they're going. Like Matthew Stafford, Jared Goff, even guys like Jimmy Garoppolo are falling around this range because when you start to see that red on the board on sleeper, when those quarterbacks start going, people get nervous. They start copping the smash button, as Mike, Mike likes to say. And then guys like Gardner Minshew, you know, they fall to the seventh, eighth round. You can get them at a value. But in those rounds, if you start to see a run happen, using this ADP tool, you know that's going to happen. So maybe you either wait it out or you use the ADP tool to your advantage, you get out ahead of it, you add a top end quarterback in the top two or three rounds, you wait out for this trend for this run to end. And then round seven, eight, you get a veteran quarterback like a Drew Brees, or you can go young and you get a Herbert. And then later on, you match it with a Ryan Fitzpatrick. So if you want to invest in wide receivers and quarterbacks, ste- not steer clear of the four through six rounds, but be wary because that is where basically all of them are going. Yeah. I mean, it just, if you just look at our BBB listener league, like, when the quarterback run hit, like people were scrambling, like guys were trading up into the sixth round. Someone traded up to like draft Tom Brady and like Drew Brees, I think in like the sixth round, right? Someone traded up to get Ben Roethlisberger in the sixth round, like Derek Carr in the seventh round, Philip Rivers in the eighth round, Jarrett Stidham in the eighth round. People <laughs> took Jarrett Stidham over Tyler Boyd, TJ Hawkinson, Evan Ingram, Christian Kirk in a, in a tight end premium league. Like, trust me, man, when, when that, when that red hits, like people, their palms get sweaty. Rational, rational thought goes out the window, man. So you can really take advantage of some of that and just to try and stay ahead of the curve um, in, in, with respect to QB runs. Like yeah, that. I'm just going to read off the board right now. It's probably going to be boring, but this is what happened in our league. From the pick 5-5 five, five to the 6-8, these are all the picks in a row. Matt Ryan, Teddy Bridgewater, Drew Locke, Cortland Sutton. So the fact that Teddy Bridgewater is going before Cortland Sutton just doesn't make sense to me. Then Ryan Tannehill, Aaron Rodgers, Cooper Cup, Gardner Minshew, so he went very early. Matthew Stafford, Terry McLaurin, Tom Brady, Sam Darnold, Kirk Cousins, Drew Brees, uh, DJ Chark, and then Jimmy Garoppolo. So all those quarterbacks are basically just running off the board. And look who's in between them. Those wide receivers, like 15 to 20. So that's a range where you need to be cautious if you don't have a wide receiver yet and you're trying to you know, pick up a wide receiver one and, or a fringe wide receiver one and you're on the back half of what looks to be a run. You might have to move up to grab one. Or if you are without a quarterback to that point, you're basically as good as dead because the chances of you leaving that with more than one quarterback are extremely, extremely low. So uh, all I have to say about this is just pick up the draft guide if you can. Look at these eight, this ADP data. As Mike said in the beginning, it's if, if nothing else, just pick it up for the ADP data because it just gives you such a good head start above other people that don't have it to see these type of trends where different runs are happening and just get out ahead of the curve and just have a leg up on your opponent. Yep. Best ADP in the business. Best product in the business, big facts only. That's all we do here, BG. Uh, you know, we're in the Discord. Again, just join up on the Discord. Join up some leagues. Uh, use the ADP to your advantage. Read the draft guide. Read the Bible. You know, read the player profiles. Just a ton of content in there for you guys. And, you know, we got lots more stuff coming out, man. Like, me and Noah are going to be putting out content all summer long, all fall, basically until one of us dis- gets COVID and dies. Uh, we're going to be here. Looking like that's about to be content. soon, Mike. It's probably yeah. right around probably the Probably going to be soon. Even if we get COVID, we'll probably stream from, from the hospital bed. If you've got your back, uh, hit us up on the Discord. You know, hit, hit us up on Twitter. You know, we're on there engaging with you all uh, as much as we can. So, hope you guys enjoyed. And, uh, yeah, see you guys in the Discord. See you guys. Peace. Oh.